head. <laughs> that size horse for you. <laughs> Good afternoon. It is Thursday, April 7th, and this is the Human Services Committee of the Metro Council. Um, Chair Welsh is present. Chair Be uh, CM Benedict is present. CM Hauser is present, and CM Withers is present. So I do detect a quorum, and so we're just going to dive right in here as we're starting a little bit late. Traffic kind of tied us all up here. Um, we are getting really close to um, being able to actually put together a report and present something to the administration in terms of a budget request. Mm -hmm. um, that if it doesn't make it, we can add it to uh, the chair's budget. Um, right. And also to be able to put together a document that we could present through the Metro Human Relations Commission system wide as things that we recommend that we do system wide to make sure that we are in compliance with um, Title VI. So, um, CM Benedict, I wanted to start with you to see if you, the last time you gave a report on some of the really good work that's already being done under Title VI in a couple of departments here, and you were going to go back and um, pull out the best things and see what you thought would work. So what can you tell us about what you think will go big time? Well, uh, so I think that there's, um, so I've still got to put that together on paper to get to the, to the group. Um, I think that you know, there's just a ton of overlap that you know we can we can can dig into, but it, I, I I owe the report and I haven't done the report. My apologies to the okay. committee for that. Okay. So that's um yeah. But and once we get that, I think that'll be the big basis of that. That'll be the framework. The framework that we can just fill in, and it should. I don't think it should take us too terribly much time to and do it, that. For me, it's I'm gonna put it on my calendar. We're going to wrap up family things tomorrow. Um, So I'll have something okay. on this next week. Cool, cool. Um, uh, CM Styles is not here today. She was going to update us on what the sister cities are doing in terms of size and about um, some sort of handheld translating device that she discovered while she, I believe, was in Argentina that she said was fantastic and she thought it might be something that we could have in Metro and use within Metro, but she is so not here. Would that be something would hand the people? It, that's kind of what my understanding was, but she really needs to give the details. I might ask her to go ahead and um, type something up and just send it out to the committee so we can we can see what she's talking about, because um, I know her work schedule doesn't make it very. It'd be great if she easy. had links in there that we could actually look at it. Yeah, I will. I will ask her if she can um, type something up and do that. Because I, I was really intrigued when she said it. She was like, this is really great, and I think this would really help. Uh, I was like, okay. Um, so, CM Hauser, uh, did you, were you able to get any more? Uh, they are putting together a formal request for how much it's going to cost. You know, you know, in general, I told you in general what right. the cost would be, which was really pretty reasonable. And to refresh your, they were saying it's like 14400 per language uh, to convert to uh, uh, CC. And that the monitors we already had in the chambers, the ones that are facing the audience, would be enough to have English on one and Spanish on the other, so we don't have that expense. But there is uh, some other services that, that we have to pay for uh, it basically so much per language so if we added another language you know how much more it was but that was all just in general it wasn't a formal right. proposal document so what they have asked for is to actually get quotes that can be a formal document that we can use for the for the budget request okay and they have not got that to me yet okay so do you do you think do we need do you think to go beyond just Spanish would it be worth it to also try to see if we could get a thing like add another screen there to like do Arabic or some other language or should we just start with Spanish or what what are thoughts on that like expanding or should we just start with well, Spanish and then we ever get a count was it somebody looking up the count of how many people speak what language in Nashville to know what the next other than what the next one after Spanish was as far as majority I think that's in was in, in this yeah it's in this it's in this report yeah from the Human Relations Commission um, the top not, languages nice and they were to Arabic and Spanish, Mandarin you know? well um yeah it was Spanish Arabic oh no yeah most common language Burmese mm -hmm. so another one Spanish that Arabic Burmese Kurdish, Kurdish, Kurdish Nepali Somali Swahili ASL 
and then I'm not Karen. Yeah. Karen French. Well, I'm I think just, like I'm through this curious what Karen. The, I mean, I'm, and I'm, I shouldn't joke, but anyway. Yeah, that's not the sure. um, so. this more than yeah, that's, that's very probably. surprising to me. What is so more than than third? So I'm just. Yeah. This is a community survey. This is a survey. So this isn't. Sorry, I just pulled open a page. But it's a pretty significant drop, it appears, between yeah. Arabic and Burmese. So. Yeah, and they, um, if we look at the data, which we have somewhere also, too, from like metro schools, they know the top seven languages that are That's spoken right. in metro schools, right. which is, I think those percentages kind of are pretty equal across the, uh, the whole yeah, I mean, metro. If there, if there are several that are like, you know, five percent or something, then... That, you know, no, we can't do that. We have But if there's like Spanish and then like five percent less than that was a, another language, we may want to consider it. Right, and I think that next one down is Arabic, and then Chinese is third, I think. Is that oh, Chinese is... Um, no, Mandarin wasn't even on there. Yeah. Um, what page are you on there? That, that, that was page... So the third one you think was Arabic? So it's English, 24, Spanish, right? Arabic? 24. Yeah. Um, that was just based on a survey. That's not necessarily statistically. You know, the community needs um, report that comes out from... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, that the community needs I don't know. Services. Do you okay. social services? Thank you. Yes. Social services um, has that type of information in it too, though. Has some really great um, yeah. info like that. Languages and such. And what would be uh, along with that helpful is in many countries, you know, the, the official language may be one, but everybody also speaks another one. And so if there are several. They speak this second language as a majority, then that might be something to look at. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm making sense. Yes. Yes, you are. Like it used to be, if you were a rural traveler, you spoke French, no matter where you came from. Right. Because so that, that was became the international, the international language. language. Where now English is the international language. Right. So here's one. In schools, it Sorry. says 41% speak Spanish. Uh, well, no. Spanish is first, Arabic is second, Kurdish is third, Somali is fourth, and Vietnamese is fifth. So those are the top five languages in metro schools. Well, it does sound like Arabic is the... Yeah, Arabic is, Arabic is big. And on page 13, it shows that the most frequently encountered non-English languages within each department or extension mm -hmm. um, uh, is Spanish, um, Arabic, Kurdish, Somali, Burmese, and then Vietnamese. So, um, and then that's, there's others after that. So, so if tons of over, I mean, we can see now. Right, the overlap. So if we're going to consider a diff additional languages, Arabic would, might be a good one, too. Um, it seems like in yeah, all the yeah. reports that came in is the next one after Spanish. And then Somali and Kurdish. Somali I think. and Kurdish would be. That, yeah. Those top four really cover a huge amount. Right, a huge percentage. I guess so we did receive an email. I, don't, I think it came to the entire committee. If it only came to me, I'm so, maybe this is why I was planning to share it here. But somebody said that on YouTube, there's auto-translation, and it's really quite well. Yeah, that on was the a streaming I mean, side. A constituent, uh, yeah. Jeremiah Wooten. Was okay, I didn't know if it came yeah. to the whole committee. And I haven't looked at it to check out if that's really true. Or but we don't stream like on YouTube, so it would be only for replay. Right. So that right. would be yeah, that would be during the live event. That would be afterwards, I right. guess. That's right. But we offer that service anyway, right? Because that's why we post things. So then we could at least direct that's people right. like here on the on the YouTube channel, you would be able to change this into your own language. You would be able to tra have that translated. So which would be great. And he said from his personal experience, the AI translation was quite good. Yeah. I do remember that. that. Yeah. Okay. So he thought that that was a worthwhile thing to look into. Okay. Um, and that actually led me into something else. You know, when we talk about translating documents. The widget that is on the Metro Nashville website that translates into all those different languages is also AI. But I wonder um, how good that is and if that is a widget that we could, and I started to talk to Slate about this the other night and then we didn't get to, to uh, finish the conversation. Um, but whether or not we could use that widget to do, to make sure in every department all of the con uh, customer facing documents are translated, even using the AI. And then you could just hire some to come in and, and fix what AI screwed up because that would make it so much more so much more affordable because a translation would already be done. I mean, in, in a broad right. sense. It'd just be the so majority it could, would be done. Uh, but yeah. the other thing about that too is um, I just recently bought a car 
Mm -hmm. Not because I wanted to buy a car, but mine like died and it was going to cost twice as much to fix than the, it was worth. Um, and when I was at the dealership and signing all those forms, they basically had like a laptop that was, the desk was a laptop. Mm -hmm. And he would like flip things around and it can... In other words, I'm saying there's a lot of technology out there. So yeah. like we were saying, the offices could maybe have a screen that the person was looking at. That no matter what this person was saying, it was would show them what was really being said in their own language. Right, right. So if we had like even a customer-facing computer in there that you could like you're on the same page with somebody in a department, but you and can have your page translated into yeah. to do whatever. And it increases the bouncing ball. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So then we're you're still waiting to remember on the bouncing ball. I remember the bouncing ball. I remember the bouncing ball. Bouncing ball. Oh, yeah. oh, see, they're yeah. a lot older than they look. Well, that must be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, so, so we can look in to see, you know, we obviously want to keep a budget request, I would think, initially. We'd want to do the test, number one, the 10-hour free test. We would like to definitely do that to see how that works and get feedback. Make sure that we're inviting people, like, from the Spanish-speaking community to come and see how... This makes yeah, sense to you. This makes sense to you, and this is... Or I see this problem or not, you know. Because um, the whole purpose of this is to make government open. Right. Right. Well, we want to we want to make sure that it's working for the communities that we're trying to serve. Right. Because otherwise, what's idea. the point, right? Yeah. If we don't have that working. Okay, so we need to get that, and we need to get your report, and that will go into. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, supposed to within the next week get those formal requests or proposals with the dollar amount, so that, that we can include that in part of our, our budget request. Okay. Um, before le the last meeting, I had uh, Rosie distribute the um, Title VI reports that each department submits. Um, and you can see, if, if you had a chance to look at that, you could see some of the problems that we're having. Um, because most of the departments said they, did, they don't do any training in Title VI to give people any idea within the department of what needs to be done. Um, most of them have no written language policies as required by Title VI, so that means definitely is something that needs to be addressed. Um, and most of them have no tracking of complaints and the follow-up of how we handled those complaints when somebody was in violation. So this, you see, that is the fundamental problem that we are trying to address right. here to get that systematized. And so I'm, I'm thinking, um, Emily, that um, that's something we should definitely look at with the health department and with um, the courts to have what, how they do that because those seem to be those are the big issues that I think where where we run afoul. Of so when we when we finish doing what we've been tasked to do, we are going to be presenting a report that says these are the areas that we see need to hit some standards or why exactly are we going to be presenting? Well, I think the first thing that we'll be presenting will be um, a budget to the administration for the immediate okay. thing of getting yeah. in council and getting that done. And then a report that talks about um, that offers a solution to make sure that each department has properly yeah. translated uh, documents and everything that is customer facing is, mm -hmm. is accessible to everyone to be in line with Title VI. And then I think we need to offer a proposal to say these are deficiencies that we see in Title VI. And if this this is when I need to loop in um, Mark, um, is it Etherly over at the Human Relations Commission? They're in the process of hiring a new ED, and so they're, they're a little bit understaffed, so I haven't been able to talk to them yet. I haven't attempted to talk to them yet, actually, because they're in the midst of that. But that's when I need to loop in Mark Etherly or whoever is the new ED at the Human Relations because mm -hmm. that's where all this rests. They are supposed to be the, the um, they are the government unit that oversees Title VI and makes sure that we're in compliance, and so we need to we need to present work with them to say this is how what needs to be done in these departments, and, and they go forth. And but we also need to, I think, come up with a proposal to that um, the Human Relations Commission and that off, we need to create like an office of. Uh, compliance or whatever for Title VI, that actually gives the Human Relations Commission some teeth so that they can go around and actually look at departments before so people are signing off and report. they're saying you are, you aren't, or... Right, to say this this, this reporting is not actually living up to what we need to be doing for Title VI. So, we, mm -hmm. so people are trained and we make sure that people are actually doing the correct thing. And when they're turning in reports, they are actually in compliance as we're required mm -hmm. to be by federal yeah. law. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of three-pronged that way. Okay. Um, um, one is the 
the real immediate thing, and the other two things I think will take longer, but we can address, um, if we can address those issues to make sure that people at least have translated documents, then we'll have to figure out, then it gets down to the interpreters in the departments, and I got this from Shannon Hall. Um, she said that tr uh, interpretation services are rendered in two ways, one by employees who are bilingual as a function of their job. So, but she couldn't really tell me how many people are actually hired, that, that their fun job function is actually to also translate. She couldn't really tell me that. Um, and then the interpretation services contracts, which are housed, she said, at the Human Relations Commission. That they, that that's where, um, that's who owns them is the Human Relations Commission. Um, and she said, from classification and employment standpoint, human resources is not aware of how many interpreters are employed by Metro. Um, those employees who are bilingual and use those functions as part of their employment are generally employed in other classifications and are generally performing the other duties as well, so that is what their primary thing is, so we can't really do that. She said they're aware, but the health department has five employees who are classified in interpreter, as interpreters. Um, and she knows that they things are regularly used in the district attorney, the public defender, but their classifications within those departments are not do not indicate that anyone is an interpreter. So um, yeah, that sounds right. And I have a question, and you may or may not already know the answer. So I let's say I speak a language other than English is my main language. So my first contact, I mean, we understand if you've already gone through it and they know you're coming, but like if I pick up the phone and I want to call a department because I've seen the number, what all, like, other than Spanish, are there any other languages you can punch a button to hear in your language? I, you know how, you, it's right. very easy to say one for English, two for Spanish, you know, but... Right. If you're something I else. don't know that I've ever heard that on a phone tree, actually. Yeah, so I, I don't either. I'm curious what the demand is for that. You know, I mean, we're we're looking at like some of it is. I mean, you know, do you say press three for all other languages and it goes to a translation line? But how does that translation line, they would still have to be connected to the department that actually can do the work? Yeah, I mean, I just don't So I'm just trying just to think, like, how do you staff, so kind of 80-20, like, I mean, I don't want to say the 80-20, well, right, the rule. Um, I don't want to suggest that 20% of the population will need to take an extra step to get translation services. Right. On the other hand, that's why we outsource these services is because we just can't have some, you know, right. enough and people just, on staff that are experts. We might just be the list. We're going through, I mean, I'm not saying this necessarily on our first swipe. Right. But as we, over time, it's kind of like anything. Okay, we, we were here. Right. right. <laughs> we're right here. Right. And we finally get to here. Then is it then time to go back and analyze well, right. what else can we can do? Because right. we are such a multi-language area. And we have been for a long time. And we're getting more so that way. Well, what is needed, and, and if the decision is, it'd be great to do that, but it's just beyond right. a budget reality, well, then we at least have an answer. Yeah. I mean, we know what, what, would it, what, what level would it take to, to get to the numbers that we would need to do that, right. or is there any yeah. anything else? I mean, it could even be, like I know, um, not just for voting, but different things. They'll have like a sheet, like if you go in to vote, and you know, they'll be like 30 different languages. Yeah, like this. And you point the juvenile one court. That, yeah, that you point yeah. to the one that's you. you know, it, but what you're talking about is people trying to access it via the phone, right. which is a whole which other. Which is different. But right. what I'm wondering is when we have our listings on our website, is there a way there that somebody could see their, like the first thing that flashes up is you choose your language, and then you see everything else. So you choose it as English, and then the website pops up, or you choose it. Well, I mean, they can do that now with with the AI widget to translate the whole website if you want to get information from there. But if they're calling a department. Well, that's different, yeah. Right. But I'm just but trying to think of different ways that we can make sure yeah. that 
as early on as possible when they interact with government, they know what should do to get something in their language. Whether right. it be that there could be instructions then of what you need to do when right. you call in or when you show up right. in your language. And I don't know that that's set up that way yet. I don't think so. But it might be something, and I said that's not necessarily this first swipe that we're doing. But it might be once these things are in place, then we look and see are there other ways that would be better. And the more we can use technology, certainly the more, more economical it is than actually having live humans do things. Right, right. Um, and there, it would be nice too if we had a way, like through the website or something else, that you, if you needed to like set up an appointment with, with a department, you could like email through the website or right. something mm -hmm. that would say, I need to set up an appointment to come down here and I need I this language service. available. Mm -hmm. So that they, you know that when you get there, they can call the language line or whatever to have someone there to do that. Right. So we'd have to figure out something like that. Um, I want to just look in here to make sure. Um, that's really all she told me about that. So she kind of was reiterating, well, we don't really have a lot of translators and in, uh, interpreters in Metro who are staffed, all, pretty much only the health department. That's what I was going to say. That's because even juvenile mm -hmm. court does, have, they have one person in charge of managing all language services. Right. But the health department is where every location has a translator um, on staff. And then some receptionists, to your point, are bilingual, but not as a part of their job right. function, mm -hmm. but rather he happens to the department. He is currently headed up by a man. Yeah. So the department happens to have people who are bilingual in some locations. Right. Mm -hmm. But they also do have access to a translation line, which is like what juvenile court does, which is what most of Metro does, I believe, when, a, when a, yeah. another language is needed. The translation line that MHC has um, the contract oversight for, we were just talking about, right? Yeah. Translation services. If, uh, anyway. Yeah. So health department the only one, you're right, that has staffed interpreters at each clinic. And they speak the main languages in the city. So I'm guessing that they might be more than bilingual. Yeah, they would they have speak to be. three or four. So, which is... What about our fire and our police when they go out on a scene and there's someone that they can't communicate with? Do they call the language line or what, what do they do? You know, I think CM Rutherford was going to look look at that to see what actually happened. Yeah. I think it was the police. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they call it on their phone for the translation service. So what they do? Okay. No, oh, okay, so that's because I'm thinking that even when you're calm, right? You operate at one level. When you're in an emergency, it's kind of like some of the things that that, that you might be able to do, you just can't because you're in that frantic yeah. state. Yeah. But the officers, uh, they call the translation service on the phone. And the same at, um, like, the 911 line, emergency, they do the same thing? Yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah. And so, that's a 24-hour thing. Yeah. yeah, so that way it's not as... I figured there had to be something, but I didn't know what it was. Yeah. The thing about, you know, um, the, the courts and things, again, they... Because that's required by law, interpreters have to be to a certain level and certified to a certain yeah. level in order before they can do it. That would be a real expense on Metro to right. have that on staff. And the thing about the health department is that because they're handling sensitive information, mm -hmm. they um, they have to they they have to have the translators. But I mean, they have to be all HIPAA compliant and everything. Those tra those those um, interpreters. interpreters rather. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, have to. Be, so it's a very specialized type of a job, mm -hmm. right? It's not like we, so I mean, you're, it needs the additional in-depth, hands-on, because it's healthcare, right. Right? right? That a translation line, I'm not sure what type of HIPAA compliance you might. Probably none. Well, there are other languages, though, that a staffed interpreter might not speak, and they do use a language line for that. That's right. So somehow there must be specialized, some. Yeah. Specialized line, or they... And maybe maybe that's not an obstacle at all. Maybe it's just that we don't do it because, I mean, I just, the, the yeah. health department does it, and maybe they don't do it just because of that. I don't mean to make the assumption that that's why yeah. they do yeah. that. Um, well, it may be that the interpreter is only translating, though, what the person who is trained is asking for and saying. So maybe that's the check and balance. Because if you're the health department person, you know only to ask for or give information about certain things. So if the interpreter is not doing anything freelance, they're just following 
month. Yeah, I think the, that might be the, the, the caution there. Yeah. yeah. I think so many scenarios, you know, I mean, when you're in the health department and you're in an exam room or you're doing, you know what I mean? Like if something's actually, you know, not, I mean, you know, you're in, having a conversation that's really got a lot of personal information in it, that mm -hmm. translator needs to, I mean, what if it's somebody, what if I speak, a Kurdish and the Kurdish community is a tight knit community as we know and and I actually know you or we go to you right. know somehow I know you in the community and now you're required to keep this information confidential right so, so they that's have, where they the have to, ha they goes, have to agree to a higher that doesn't level. happen much but I guess my point is that trying to and you know what I kind of feel like the health department probably has those policies already in place because they're so good at it already well that's right they I'm must just, have the whole yeah. you know I believe the um, health practitioners also rely Lie heavily on family members. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, they do. But is that a question that we should ask as part of our research? What what training is given to those interpreters? That well, they you said are the health department was every year. Everyone is trained, correct? Mm -hmm. They yeah. go through yep. training. Yeah, the the PowerPoint that I've got. So, and I know that. So I'm going to put give myself a deadline end of business Wednesday to get that framework out because these are I think going to be really helpful. So. Yeah. Again, my apologies that it's taken this long. I probably should have had this taken off my plate. Would you plate. not want that left up to an individual to, to determine what is private and what is it? You would want it's all be private. Yeah. Like that. It would have to be something private. you're trained in. Yep. Every employee at the health department gets the training. Every employee. Because you never know when you're going to run into some PPA, PPI. Well, that's, yeah, and 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 even just or PI, right? PII. P, is it personally identified? Oh, PII, right? PPI. PII. Oh. Yeah, I don't. I think it's H. Yeah, I think it, it is. It is HIPAA. It's, it's, it's PII. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But there's, anyway, there's only one P. Right. I don't know. So, personally identifying information. information yeah, yeah, I think that's correct. Nashvilleians know we're solving the world's problems today in this committee. <laughs> well, you know what? For the we ones we're are. here to do, for the ones we're here to do, we are. We are. Yeah. Yes, we are. We are working on the problems to which we are assigned. Yes. And I think I think we're getting really close, and I think we are going to be able to come up with um, yeah. really good suggestions that will have a major impact. Yeah. Is what I feel like. Um, I feel like we are going to be able to do that, and I feel like we're going to get this stuff funded and, and get this taken care of, and then it's something that we can build on, like you said, as we go with adding right. the new language. So a lot of times you can't whatever. see that level until you get some other things taken care of. Right. Kind of like at home, you don't even see that little mess over here because there's all these other messes, and you clean that and you go, oh my gosh, what right. about this? Right, exactly. Maybe I'm speaking from my own personal life. <laughs> So one of the things you had talked about, um, Gloria, you had talked about the uh, free 10-hour test on stuff. Right. When, when should we consider running a test? Um, when should we, because I would think that we would want to do that before we want to make the budget request. Let so that check. we can actually Let see. Let me check with Slade and see how we So like next meeting maybe or yeah. something, if that's going to be possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll ask and see if they can get that set up so we can test that out. Yeah, and then we could maybe even do the following meeting, you know, just a couple of, because 10 hours, well, I mean, any, if it's budget season, it could all be in one meeting. meeting. If the mayor's office already anticipated that, going to do that, that during the meeting, we can ask for that. No. I, I would drop a line just to say that um, our committee is working on this. We, so. we need to get some people in the audience that, that, that speak. Yeah, well, we'll, yeah. we'll let, I'll let, like, Turk and a couple of the organizations know that we're testing this out. So they, they can, can bring help us say, people. does this make sense or is yeah. it ridiculous right. or is it helpful or is it confusing? Well, that's or a really good idea. But, yeah, I would, I think it's worth dropping a, lo a note to the mayor's office just to let them know that we're working on it. Um, and who at the mayor's office would I direct that to? I'd go to Jameson. Jameson? Yeah, Jameson. I would just yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will. I will drop him. I have to well, drop him a line about something else too. But I'll check and see if it can be done that quickly, or if they need more lead time, or what. Okay. Yeah, the sooner the better. The sooner the better, because yeah, before we make an ask, we really want to see how that's going to work and whether that's going to, you know, have an impact. 
Um, and then as soon as we know that, we can do a little bit of a press push and we can actually get like um, uh, Ruben De Peña over MMPS to do in their next school blast, in the Metro right, blast, so to put out, we're gonna be testing out this new thing and so if you're interested and you wanna come in and see how this works and mm -hmm. offer feedback because we're looking for feedback. And this is something I would think that we could pass on to MNPS, right? Yes. In time. When we talk about, you know, citywide, most often I think we think about, I mean, I don't, I think about the schools too, right? But I, you know, we, I feel like that because the schools has its own board, right? I mean, I guess that's true within a number of departments, but many times with schools, I think they've already got this figured out probably. Right. Metro government is where we need to focus. Right. But it's, it's, it's all the way across, I'm sure. Yeah. So. Oh, and one thing that the, the costs for this, um, is there a limited number of, is there a limited time like for that 14, four years at, so say we started having other meetings in chambers because it had this this ability. I have to find right. out. I, I'm not, um, I just, I don't have the answer. But so I'll that would be good to know because okay. people might want. Per minute or something like that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, or is it like you're actually limited to like 30 hours a week or 30 hours a oh. month or you know what I mean, something like that under this cost or um, right. you know, is What's it. What's included in the 14, four basically. Right. Because I would, I would think, I could be wrong, but I would think that some uh, committees and things might want to start meeting in chambers if it has this ability, especially with the issues that actually um, affect, greatly affect these non-English speaking communities, non-English as a first Absolutely. language communities. Um, and you know, we should be, chambers should be used more, honestly. You know, I think it's, it's a good meeting space and a functional meeting space. And it's a lot of technology available. Yeah, a lot of technology yeah. available and whatever. So that would be good to know because then what? then that could be, if there's any kind of limitation to that or if we started having more meetings, it's not just yeah. limited to like, you know, it's just so much three per, meetings a week well, or, yeah, you know, like, whatever that is. Um, I obviously do not have my notebook with me. Do you have a, anybody have an extra pen or page? Can, I don't know if I have. I want to trust my memory. No, don't trust your memory. Hold on, what about, I must have something in here. I'm sorry, I used the embedded pad. I thought I had my pad in there, but I don't. That's okay, Gloria. Just, oh, wait, oh. here, I have this. Oh, I know. So, yeah, you can yeah. write yourself, uh, write so yourself a note there and then pull up the back. Thank you. So I, I want to know if uh, if there's any limitation. Next, what what do you get for that fourteen forty uh, for each language? What what do we actually get? Is there any any type of limitation? Because you know we're focusing first primarily on um, the, the council meetings, but it's yeah. it's possible that once this service is in place, that other other committees and things would um, want to use that. Yeah. Would want to avail themselves of the system. Yeah, because it makes it so much more patience, yeah. Right. Um, and then um, we want to know whether or not we can get a test set up for like the next council meeting, which right. is, you know, if, if possible. That would be great if we can. If yeah. And then because, and the sooner we can know that, the better, because um, again, we'll do, we can do immediate push to get it out. So it's going to be trying a new, you know, a new system. Yeah. And we, we want people to come in and it's, and let people know that the possibility exists that it could down the pike expand to other languages that are, you know, mm -hmm. the more um, popular languages in Nashville that are spoken. And in at Nashville. some point in time, because right now we're just taking one more on, we probably need to set some kind of criteria of what it takes for a language to rise to the level that we would invest in, in interpretation services. Um, um, and I that, think probably we that 10,000 people, or is that a certain percentage, or and that may not even be our our role to call. It may be somebody right. else, but that might be something that some criteria because you don't ever want to be seen as preferring something over another. Right, right, right. Um, and I'm sure that information exists somewhere that actually what what is the breakdown and whatever. Mm -hmm. And we could we could track kind of with like what the schools know and whatever and what this survey um, what this survey showed from mm -hmm. the Human Relations right. Commission because they seem very much in line, mm -hmm. you know, um, with each other. Yeah, in we terms were seeing of the same numbers as, as you looked at the various surveys, the yeah. same languages mm -hmm. were popping up. Which makes, you know, which makes perfect sense. Um, all right, let me see if there was, does anyone have anything else that they feel like we need um, to talk about? Mm -hmm. 
Again, I feel like um, we're getting very, very close on this, and I think once we have all this, and I will find out, um, I will, I will get ask CM Styles to like do a write up about these handheld translators and what they do, um, with links to where we can find them, so we can see and figure. I mean, out. you know, maybe that we look through and we figure out oh, they're only fifty bucks each, and for two hundred bucks we could solve a problem. Right. Right. That we could we could have a few like in all the various departments that have the most consumer facing, mm -hmm. you know, information like that. Um, and I think everybody had. Do we need to give you a task, CM? I would love a task. Do you want me to follow up with the mayor's office for the budget? Yes. <laughs> Since I mentioned that one, I'll yeah, be happy you to do, do that. that. That would be great. <laughs> what else um, can I do for you? <laughs> and we. Um, what else should we make? Brett Withers do. Oh, we have a fiscal note of fifty million for the homeless. My car can get me clean. <laughs> yeah. This is this is another item that's not really. Um, but I am putting together an ARP proposal. I heard that. Yeah. Oh, good. For um, homelessness and um, that. Yeah. Hopefully, you're going to have have that right. finished very, very soon. I'm getting some feedback on it right now and, and double checking all the numbers. But um, I would like that, if possible, to be able to come essentially from this committee, um, and um, I can send everyone the draft um, so that everyone can have a look. That'd be great. Yeah, um, and the money would be um, under the purview of um, MHID, so I need to also let the administration know that that so that MHID knows that if we would get this, the money would be there. Um, some of the money would be for new staff people and. Including, including um, uh, a real estate broker, what part of their job would be, um, and I'm trying to remember which department that is, I can't remember, but part of their job would be to actually act as a broker and go out and find these properties that we talked about on our homelessness issue and stuff like that. So I will, um, I will. Would that, would that be an employee or would that be somebody be contracted with? It, a, uh, a I was thinking it, uh, an employee, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see because I think ultimately that might be less expensive, especially for money that we know it's a it's a two year revenue stream. But anyway, I'll send the proposal and you can all see okay. it. And yeah. um, any feedback would be great um, because I'd like to um, to get it out as soon as I can, like before the homelessness planning commission, to see if they would um, endorse it and you know yeah. kind of get the you know. Well, I'm hearing oh from of course you're, you're in real estate, so you you are living breathing that. What I'm hearing from my friends in real estate is is finding properties yeah. to sell. It's we not just, finding buyers. We got buyers everywhere. Oh my word, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yep. So there's not enough inventory. I was actually when we got here, I had been on the phone with one of my clients who's looking for a house. Other states wanting to know if they want to sell, and I'm like, well, yes. I mean, they're, and they're they've like, got a client that's looking in that right of just under three hundred thousand dollar a year price. I mean, a three hundred thousand dollar price range, and. And it's just, I mean, you know, that's where most of my clients are. I, I work with buyers like that, and many of them, and um, um, and and it's just such a difficult price point. There was a property that had 24 offers on it the other day. So, I mean, and that's not unheard of at all. That's very common these days, especially at that price point. I think most of us probably which is affordable housing right now these days. Yeah. None of us can afford to We can buy what we are. Right. Actually, I do have another uh, thing for you, okay. Brett, if you're willing. Yeah. If you could talk to, um, pick up the thread of that conversation that I started with Slade, because we didn't get very far, mm -hmm. about whether that widget, that's what is that widget on the website that translates everything, and whether that's something that mm -hmm. we could use that widget, um, I, this might have been before you were here, but you know, to use that widget to like transfer all com consumer facing documents, and then, oh, you were here, and then have them, then we could have another service actually go through an edit to make sure that all the language is absolutely correct, since that is AI. But to see if that is a if that is a widget that somehow can be incorporated into um, other departments, even if we could department pages, if the department has its own specific website, whatever, or some they stuff, click your and then they could click and have something that would be translated immediately by the widget, and that would at least help to facilitate on translated things. But then we could do like a one-time project to make sure all existing consumer-facing, customer-facing documents are translated into those top languages. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because if that, that widget does, there are quite a few languages up there that, that the widget will translate the website into. I was yeah. shocked at how many yeah. that it would translate. So if there's a way that that can be used in different capacity to do that, that could really help us to save money. And it would be on Metro's website? Well, it's already on Metro's website. I was wondering if that can be put into something else, so for example, that we could take... They would have to upload like all consumer-facing documents into a website or something, and then have each document translated, and then it could be 
um, printed out and to to translators that we hire, like people that translate per word or per page, yeah. we could then have maybe have a project where we give them a whole stack of, they're essentially already translated and you are just verifying the accuracy and making the changes mm -hmm. that need to be made to make sure these documents are accurate, then we can have them printed out and they're done. Instead of having somebody translate from scratch. Right. I'm just thinking that could maybe right. perhaps, could, right. and it might just be a total pipe dream, like no, there's not a chance. But I thought if you don't have to do it from the get-go. That's right. right. Hey, they can take so that it takes probably seventy percent off of it. Right, right. And, and so we could be essentially well, saving is then money. Once we have to be the for print saved, they don't right? have to be printed each time. Right. It's only you come in and you speak Swahili. Well, I haven't had one in six months, so I don't need one hundred and fifty of those documents. It's okay for you. Right, you can yours do it. Off. Yes, it would. They would be documents because these because translation would just it's just the printed stuff. So it would be all. Um, customer-facing documents in every department to make sure that they are done correctly so that the language, the translation or whatever is correct and then it's like... When you need them, you print them. Gloria is saying if somebody comes in and they speak Swahili in your office, we know that that was actually translated correctly. Okay. And so they could access that document it's correct and just make a copy. You can have one copy of something and make another and then, copy. And part of the process of the right documents, we need to verify all those things at right. that time. Oh, that's right. That's a good good idea. That's because that it, I mean, and it might not work, but if there is a way to you, that widget was just kind of amazing when I went up there and saw every, all the languages it would translate to. And I know it's AI, but AI has gotten so much mm -hmm. better. Um, and if that could, you know, cut 70, 50, even 50% 50 of the cost of having things translated. And, and then we, you know, right now, most departments have, I think, or they're supposed to have all their customer facing documents translated or accessible, but that's what we're going to find out if we actually do well, have them all translated okay. and accessible. So we can also suggest that's how we can get that done. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I don't really have anything else on the agenda. This was actually yeah, the I'm agenda from the last meeting when we did not have a quorum, so it kind of saved me from having to do a oh, new that's agenda. Right. So this is good. Okay. Um, but if, if we, if no one has any other questions or comments or complaints. One thing a little bit unrelated to this, and you may have talked about this, but I wanted to follow up on it, is uh, Brian Hale, who's the CEO of Neighborhood Health Services, mm -hmm. had, uh, I work closer with him with um, Casey, and I guess some of the health provider type groups are working on, they have concerns that when folks go to Metro Social Services or things like that, that if they apply for different programs with different departments, they have different Application, application forms and things like that, and so they're they're looking this, at this effort that's called like uh, the time tax that it calls people to fill out multiple documents and trying to see how much of the they can get streamed. Okay, I can tell you that my neighbor developed a whole thing that multi-populates documents like that, and I haven't yeah. had a chance to talk to him yet when I got that letter. Okay, yeah. Um, but I think his is based on. Um, well, I don't remember now. It was a while ago they talked to me about it, but um, he was actually looking that to get that like out there for people to use because he had gone through that whole thing of having yeah. to fill out the same information multiple times. And this thing that he developed, apparently, you fill out the stuff once and it goes into all these different documents, so everything is filled out at once and you don't have to repeat mm. yeah. documents. So I need to talk to him. He just has he's been out of town, so okay. I haven't been able to yeah. talk to him. I just got it on Tuesday and I thought, oh, he needs that. Okay. You know, he can do that. He's got something, so. But yeah, that should also be something that we do because that falls under our purview. Right, I mean, and they get a streamlined as we yes. can for people. Yeah. yeah. It's very frustrating to have to fill out a document over and over and over and over and over. Oh, yeah. Again. We've all experienced that, that's for sure. And you're like, why isn't this saved? Why? Yeah. Not? Right. And the, 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 the margin of error just gets so much larger when you have to keep typing. Every things. time you type something, you have a chance of making a mistake. Yeah. Every time you do it. So. Okay. But yeah, I will. I will. Uh, you and I can. I just did, yeah. I just didn't know that. if that had been discussed previously and I may have missed it. But. It, it hasn't. But I'm gonna, I will talk to my neighbor and I will also update it. Um, I'll update you about that, whatever he tells me about. Um, given that I don't know what systems they use, but he had this whole thing done just as well. It sounded like they were wanting more, all or more of the departments to use the same form. This is the approach that they were taking, but this this approach may help also. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll see. I think the only thing that, that flashed when we were saying that, it sounds like a convenience point that would be great, but the security has to be there that it doesn't go somewhere yeah. we don't want it to go. That would be the only caution. Yeah. 
Yeah, because especially in the health field, that's where we get a lot of that, um, the PII. Yeah. We want to make sure that that's protected. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we're set again to do this. Uh, the next council meeting is whatever date I forget. That Thursday. If this is not a good time for people, we can talk about you know another time. Um, Maybe, can, maybe you, you know. could just send a message to those that haven't made it and say, well, we know yeah. Druffle is just out until yeah. next semester. And John was just out tonight. He generally has been able to make it. So, so it's really you, just joy. So joy is in me. And me. And I yeah. had a couple of family. And a, Jessica's mom passed. So we were, yeah. so she was, and it was sudden. So we were at the hospital a lot for two weeks. So anyway, so that's why I'm. But those things like, just happen. That's right. And so, so I didn't make the, you know, there was, a, I think, two meetings I missed during that time. You actually missed one. Only one? I believe so. It feels like so many because I, I owe this homework. <laughs> and we I just piled more on you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> we just piled more on you. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, cool. All right, well, thank you, guys. Um, and uh, I guess we're adjourned. Okay. Thank you. Good deal. been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.